You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 105. Like comedy, horror has the ability to provoke thought and further the conversation on real social issues in a very powerful way. Jordan Peele. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to a special edition of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie is going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And today's show is also sponsored by the Heart Chart Screenwriting Masterclass taught by legendary screenwriter James V. Hart the writer of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Hook, and Contact, to name a few. His unique story mapping system will teach you how to get your script ready for production and the marketplace. To gain instant access, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash heart chart. That's H-A-R-T chart. Now, guys, you are in for an amazing treat today. I'm so excited about this. This is part one of a three-part series that I'm going to be releasing on the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, where the legendary screenwriter, James V. Hart, writer of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Contact, August Rush, and Hook, just to name a few of his films, is going to be interviewing some of the top screenwriters in Hollywood. And first up is Oscar winner Jordan Peele, the writer of Get Out and Us. In this conversation, James and Jordan kind of break down uh, Get Out specifically and how he came up with the story, how he worked the characters, how he developed the entire script. And James starts talking to him about charting the emotional journey of his characters using his story system, The Heart Chart. So without any further ado, please enjoy the conversation between James V. Hart and Jordan Peele. Thank you, Jordan, for doing this. Um, Not everybody in the audience is going to know the film Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Mm -hmm. But was this an urban legend or did did this have something to do with with the not the genesis of of Get Out? But there were comparisons. There were it was very controversial for its time uh, in terms of race relations. <clears throat> it, it did have a, a, a good deal to do with um, how I developed the story. I, you know, the the the, the beginning nuggets of this uh, screenplay uh, were really coming coming from a emotional place, a feeling, and and the the fear that I wanted to capture in this movie was this fear of being observed. Um, and being, being, being observed by a bunch of people who are acting like they're not observing you. And I think I quickly sort of tied that in with race and the feeling of being um, black in a white space. And uh, I was writing the script. I had, several, I had several different versions of the story going. And at some point I realized, oh, this is, it's Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. So I, I think I was I was operating with a version of it where uh, a girl brings her boyfriend to meet all of her high school friends, and it was uh, all sort of inside joke and all that. And, and at some point, I realized, no, this has got to be a family thing. And well, was, it makes it more grown up. It takes it out of the the kind of teen, uh, you know, uh, 
exploitation or horror film. You know, yes. It's a very smart yes. movie. And there's a, wi- a wider sort of variety of um, people to interact with. And uh, there, there's also a, um, a, a certain, uh, as you said, there's a certain adult relatability to the fear of meeting your potential in-laws for the first time. <laughs> Um, and I recognize like, look, you know, I guess I knew this was a tough one, yeah. be a tough one to, to sell. Um, cause people, I, I think people would assume when hearing the premise that there's no way this can be done right. Um, so, you know, looking back at how guess who's coming to dinner, I think one of the reasons that was able to sort of cross the, um, the boundary of racism and become a popular movie was, was that everyone knows what it feels like to meet your in-laws. And uh, that's, that's universal, even though this particular dynamic is, you know, makes it extreme. You started, um, I believe you started the idea for Get Up. Was that always the title? Was Get Out always the title? Uh, no, for a while, it was, I, the working title was Get Out of the House. Okay. Yeah. Guess who's getting out of the house? Yeah. Guess who's getting um, out of the house? Yeah. There was a different president when you, I believe there was a different president when you first started working uh, on the script or on the idea. Did any of the political changes and shifts from uh, the Obama administration to the Trump administration, did that have, begin, have any impact on the evolution of the story? I'm not trying to get political. I'm just wondering how the, did your mood change? Did something change inside you or outside you? Uh, Yes. Uh, you know, the, uh, Trump was, was basically elected, um, between when I shot the movie and when it came out. And, uh, so that was in the editing phase. And by the time we were in the phase of picking up some additional photography, um, uh, Trump was a, I don't think he had been elected yet. I'm not sure, but, um, the climate, was uh, the uh, uh, surrounding race was becoming more out in the open. And there was this discussion of Black Lives Matter was happening um, in a way we hadn't seen. And yeah, more, more specifically, there was the tension being brought to you know, Black people being murdered by police. And uh, so because the Obama era was just surrounded with this post-racial lie as I, as I like to call it um, <laughs> all of a sudden I was sort of showing this movie and testing it in a world that was race weary you know yeah. so, uh, several months later but uh, both for good and bad reasons race weary um, so uh, but I remember specifically feeling that um, the the original when I showed the original ending, which was, of course, um, as you probably know, um, Chris. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't end well. Um, Chris ends up in prison, and it's um, it's meant to be a gut blow, but it's also a downer. It was an extra special downer, and be, because the state of the world had evolved, and the, these conversations were happening, so that's when I made the decision to give us a happy ending. Which I don't know if I would have in the Obama era firmly in the Obama era where everyone was, you know, seemed certain that race wasn't a thing anymore. Well, there's one of the, one of the, the struggle of the struggle that a writer, these are all writers and they're all interested in the process and the struggle with beginnings and endings, you know, is, is what we all go. We all wake up at that nightmare, you know? So one of the principles that we'll be discussing today, instead of a happy ending or a sad ending, I refer to it as a satisfying ending. Did you mm. give your audience an ending that they're satisfied with, not that they're pissed off by or feel derailed or cheated by? Is it satisfying? So did you, you wrestled with this ending? Did you wrestle with it in post or, or was it, did you wrestle with it when you were shooting? How did you, how did you find that satisfying ending? When, when I, I wrestled with it in the script phase and I wrestled with it in post. So in the script phase, um, as you do, I had many different ways this could go. Um, and, um, there were, there was several different endings, some, some nobody even knows about, uh. um, but, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, in the script phase, I settled on the, the gut blow version, you know, Hey, you, you know, you might only get to do this once. Boom. 
um, hit them with it and uh, rip the rip the fun out from under them. You know, you already they've already given me their money, sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it is you know, as we got closer, and I got, no, go ahead. Are, well, yeah, as we got closer to the. Um, you know, the, the launch uh, and, and I really realized this is really happening. And I'd done so much work to serve the audience. And I think that's just where I come from as a, a filmmaker. I think the other version, the badass, um, I don't care what you think of my film. I made my film uh, thing is, is not really me. I, 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 come, I come from comedy. You know, so I, <laughs> in my soul, the one guy that's not laughing is my failure. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, you know, I, I went with the, in the last uh, hour, I felt very content with the decision that you got, we have to give him a hero. And more importantly, the moment the car comes up, the cop car come, rolls up and the audience goes, <gasps> Oh, uh, 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 your guy. Yeah. Mm. That, that moment, um, achieves my point. Yeah. Right. Uh, no matter how much farther I take it, um, they've done, they've done the work. I don't need to make, I don't need to make a point. They've made the point. So it's even more subversive and more um, elegant to let that be and then give us our fun win as well. Well, that paranoia, that, that paranoia still creeps up on everybody. I don't care what your ethnic background is. When that cop car shows up, you're going, fuck. No, <laughs> no. Right. It's, it's antler guy. Yeah. It's deer, it's deer hunter cop. You know, it's the, the yes. antler guy on the road. Um, there, the, so talk, the, you mentioned something that I'm a big proponent of in the work that we do with structure is audience. You talked about you're an audience guy. And a lot of filmmakers and a lot of writers don't ever have the audience present in their process. And I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, but could you, so they're not just hearing it from me. Could you talk about the audience a little bit in your, when you're writing and when you're thinking that you're, are you, do you bring them with you? Uh, what's, what's your, what's your connection to the audience in the, in this process? Uh, I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I've, because I've been on stage a lot and I, 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 and done a lot of comedy, live, live comedy, I think I do have a nice little extra voice of the audience in my head. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm always in with comedy. You're always thinking about the audience because you're always trying to subvert their expectations um, be, uh, so that they don't get ahead of you and say, okay, you're, you're dumb or, you know, this is dumb or this is trying to speak to somebody who's less intelligent than I am. As far as I'm concerned, the, the audience that, you know, there's no movie without the audience. Um, yep. there's no, it doesn't exist if someone's not seeing it for the first time or whatever. Um, so anything less than trying to get every single member of the audience um, is kind of lazy. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, you have to assume there is a way uh, to get what you want as an artist and to give the audience what they want. Well, um, I guess ultimately they decide whether you're a success or not. Doesn't matter how hard you work or how many years you slaved over. And there's that. Well, the stakes are you're going to be often your ability to do it again or do yeah. another one or do one. So that's pretty important. I appreciate that. Two last questions real quickly. You said that this is a movie you have to see more than once. What is it that people miss that they what, – what is it that we mostly miss in that first viewing that when we go back a second time we go, oh, I mean, I'm not sh- it would be interesting to hear your view on that. Yeah, well, you know, any certainly uh, any movie with a reveal or a, a twist, um, you can watch again and um, with a new perspective on the, the the what what you saw the first time pre-twist. Um, a movie that kind of honors that second viewing um, and the first really is a movie where the clues were there. Yeah, if you. Uh, it, you know, you, 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 but you missed them. 
I, I think that's the most satisfying thing as an audience to feel like I wasn't treated like I'm a, a dum dum, but uh, because I'm not, and I almost got it, but I didn't. And he then went. Sh- you can see the proof that he was uh, given. He was laying out the breadcrumbs for me. Yeah. Uh, um, especially so like, I mean, in this in movie, the, yeah, like the opening. Is, I had to watch it twice to go. Oh, that's the guy. Yeah, you know, that's that's what Keith's yeah. That's that's uh, kidnapped in the beginning. Yeah. Um, that yeah, that's what I think. You know, there there's I, I put a lot of detail to make sure that second viewing it worked, and there's these layers. I mean, the, the a big uh, uh, thread to follow, of course, is Rose, and um, you know now now what we know from Rose, you know, the first moment we see her, she's you know having a moment in a She's selecting a pastry with that weird, weird little smile on her face. That first time you watch it is just the the sweetest ingenue you could imagine, and it has a completely different, sinister take the next time. So there's all there's many of her actions that are mean something different uh, going through. And my my favorite, of course, is the um is the the thread with the the fa- the, the grandfather and the yeah. grandmother, Walter and George. And uh, this yeah. idea that gr- Grandpa had um, lost uh, to Jesse Owens, yeah, and, and no, um, she can run fast. He's always chasing that. You know, he, yeah. he he built this mythology that it was a ra- there was a racial reason he didn't win. And, um, that this whole thing kind of comes from that. That's why, of course, we see Walter running. Well, that's what's diabolical about the ending. I mean, I, I specifically have not charted the ending until today when we do this live with our our group because mm-hmm. the ending is diabolical. It's, I mean, it, the roller coaster ride you take us on and the ups and downs, and it's like whoa, one reveal after another. That all that's what I mean. It's a very satisfying ending. Uh, all you. of your conflicts, all the threads you pulled together, in a very satisfying ending. And she creeps me out. She creeps me uh, out. Uh, Rose. Betty. Rose, oh, Rose. Betty. oh yeah. Betty's incredible. That actor, uh, yeah, I forgot her name, but those Betty Gabriel who plays Georgina, yeah, incredible. Georgine, incredible. Very good. Yeah. Um, Allison Williams is, uh, yeah. The, the the fact that she can do both sides of that performance just shows you how good a liar she is, really. <laughs> yeah. No, it's amazing. The same smile when I have got the keys that she has at the pastry store. The same. Right. So, right. last last question. Okay. Is there going to be a get outer? I, you know what? As, as the farther I move from it, um, I don't think so. Uh, you know, I will. You know, and that, never say never. Um, I, I will. I'll tell you this: I would never do it as like a money grab. I would only yeah. do it because yeah. I, I've got the story to. Um, uh, make the whole the get out universe that much sweeter, and uh, you know I got some ideas, but I, right now I don't have it, and I, I love making new um, worlds. Well, we really appreciate your taking the time to to talk to us today, and I know everybody behind me and around me. I'm giving my best Bradley Whitford in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> um, is 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 enjoying is about to hopefully enjoy this next hour and a half and we certainly have enjoyed your film and look forward to uh the next adventure that you bring us and well, um, thank you it's it's called us and it uh comes out march 15th ah. uh 19th so it's coming up i'm editing it right now um it's good are we going to laugh more on this one you know what you know, it's it is. I'll, I'll tell you what. I you will laugh. Um, you will be scared. Um, and you there will there will like get much like get out. There will be a range. Yeah. Well, coming from you, we'll take it as gospel and not and not to think that to expect anything less. So here's your little. Tribute. Oh my god! We're all clicking our teacups. I'm actually, I'm actually in the in the um, chair. The, the chair right now. This is Missy's chair. I love it. I love it. So perfect. Satisfying ending. I want to thank James and Jordan for that amazing conversation. And if you want to get access to James V. Hart's masterclass over on IFH Academy, 
just head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash heart chart. That's H-A-R-T chart. Like I said before, this is a three-part series. So part two, James will be talking to another Oscar-winning screenwriter, which is going to blow your minds. I cannot wait to get those out for you, so keep an eye out for that. They're going to be mixed in with our regular scheduled programming, but keep an eye out for that. Thank you so much for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv. 